you'll magnify your holy name in our midst in Jesus name we're asking oh Lord that everyone here from the children to the teenagers the students the youths as well as the fathers and the mothers and the brothers and the sisters everyone young and old Lord we pray you'll open the windows of heaven and you pour your spirit your power upon every one of us in Jesus name we're asking oh Lord you give us a heart that seeks after you the heart that passionately looks for you and the heart that is bent and seriously committed to finding you in Jesus name we ask oh Lord that every word you speak from all the preachers and all the teachers and the leaders Lord we pray every word will do good in every one of our lives in Jesus name and our time in your presence our time as we visit your word, our time as we pray unto you, will be fruitful and productive in Jesus' name. You bless every one of us in every way, spirit, soul, and body. Bless every individual, bless every family, and bless the whole church of God. Thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. I welcome every one of you to this special Easter retreat in Jesus' name. This Easter retreat, as you have discovered, is titled Tenfold Power Increase Retreat. That means as we look at the power of the Almighty God, upon our lives upon our families upon the church of god a multiplication of the power of god an increase of the power of god an outpouring of the great mighty unprecedented power of the lord if that is going to happen and i know it's going to happen i said i know it's going to happen and if you're going to allow this outpouring of the mighty power of the Lord upon your life, you'll have to, of course, have the interest in the word of God. Have the interest in the presence and the power of the Lord. That you come to seek the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. That you bring everything within you, in your spirit, in your mind. The totality of your personality you bring everything to the lord and say lord i bring myself to you as an empty vessel and i want you to fill me to overflowing and the lord will do it for you in jesus name so that at this retreat it will be your portion it will be the reality of experience in your life that this manifestation of the tenfold power of the Spirit of God will be yours. As we talk about this tenfold power, we're starting from tonight. And you'll notice, by the way, all the preachers that are coming to talk to us here and over there where you are in your retreat location, they'll be linking you up, plugging you with the mighty power of the Lord. And I believe if you will just connect with the Lord and with his word as his servants and ministers are speaking to you, you'll find you'll be full of power before you go. And this power will work in a very dynamic way, in an irresistible manner in your life. We're looking at Deuteronomy chapter 32. Deuteronomy chapter 32, reading from verse 30. For their vine is of the vine of Sodom, and of the field of Gomorrah, that's verse 32. Their graves are graves of gall. Their, their clusters are bitter. Verse 33, their wine is the poison of dragons. And the cruel venom of asps. 
is not this laid up in store with me and sealed up among my treasures that tells you that you confront another power there is a power maybe behind you against you opposed to you and if you don't have the power of god this other power confronting you opposing you contradicting you will then overcome you that's why we need the power of the lord to be able to overcome to be able to conquer to be able to defeat to be able to crush to be able to pull down every other power powers of darkness powers of evil powers of the wicked powers of the cruel all around we need this multiplication or this tenfold power to be able to overcome and subdue every other power that may confront us now you look at verse 30 how should one chase a thousand and two put ten thousand to flight except their rock had sold them and the lord had shot them up you see the tenfold multiplication we're talking about there it tells us one shall chase a thousand that means a thousand enemies a thousand difficulties a thousand problems a thousand challenges that may come upon your life it says just one child of god living in covenant relationship with the lord one shall chase a thousand and then it says two if those two are in agreement together if those two join together if those two join their forces their hearts their aspiration their ambition if they join together that you shall put ten thousand to flight that means then when we come together when we unite together spirits spirit and soul our energy our power is increased tenfold it tells us in Joshua chapter 23. Joshua chapter 23. Reading from verse 10 all through to verse 11. Joshua 23 verse 10. One man of you shall chase a thousand. Do you know that whatever problems confront you, whatever challenges you may face in this retreat as we pray together you will overcome because it says just one and and i don't even know anyone here that has a thousand problems i don't know anyone here that has a thousand challenges i've not met anyone here yet that has a thousand enemies neither have i met anybody here still that has a thousand sicknesses and yet it says even if you have a thousand that when the power of god comes in your life as an individual it says one shall chase a thousand for the lord your god he it is that fighteth for you as he has promised you take good heed therefore unto yourselves that she love the lord your god it says on condition that you love the lord your god on condition that you are passionate you are fervent in your love for him on condition that you are not lukewarm on condition that with all your heart all your soul and all your mind you want to love the Lord and you desire, you determine to love the Lord and in a practical way, you're actually a reality. You love the Lord. It says then, even if you add a thousand, 
problems to confront a thousand challenges to overcome even if you had a thousand sicknesses to overcome even if you had a thousand enemies to overcome it says you'll be able to overcome on the basis of your love for the lord that's the old testament joshua tells us a thousand will be able to do it one person will be able to chase a thousand enemies Deuteronomy, Moses told us the same truth. And he says, just one believer who puts his faith in God, who stands on the unchanging promises of God with the mighty power of the name of Jehovah. He says, one will chase a thousand and the two together. They'll be able to put 10,000 to flight. Now come to the New Testament in Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18. I'm reading from verse 19. Matthew 18, verse 19. Again, I say unto you, that if two of you shall agree on earth, as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father, which is in heaven. Still talking about unity. About agreement. About fellowship. About love. Hearts join together. Hearts meet together. Hearts in fellowship together. That if you come to pray, and the two of you, two believers, you are joined together in love. You are joined together in fellowship. You are joined together in faith. It says anything that even goes beyond the multiplication by ten. It says now anything you ask, anything you desire, anything you claim according to the promise of the Lord. It says the two of you will be able to ask anything you want and the Father will do it for you. I believe at this time, the Lord will do it for us. I said the Lord will do it for us. A lot of promises given in the word of God. And we need to look at a few of them. And yet understand, as you come to this retreat, if you have a different heart from what you used to have, if you have a different mind from what you used to have, a different perspective, a different passion, a different love, a different desire, that you say in this retreat, the Lord is going to bless me, and you make up your mind, and you concentrate and focus on just seeking the Lord, and seeking the blessing of God in your life, you will not miss the blessing. The Lord will grant you all the blessings you desire and everything you pray for in Jesus' name. The believers tenfold power in prayer. Believers tenfold power in prayer. That means uh, if you are not a believer yet, you must you must become a believer, a believer in Christ. That will believe that Jesus died for you on the cross of Calvary. And then you confess your sins to the Lord. And you say bye-bye finally forever to all those sins. And then you receive Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. Because the Bible says that if you believe with your heart that God raised him from the dead. And that you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. You'll be saved. That's how you become a believer. As many as received him, to them he gave the power, the authority and the right to become the sons of God. Even to them that believe on his name, that believing on his name then qualifies you, you are now a believer. And then it also says there is a temple power in prayer. Believers who don't pray, they don't get much. Believers who don't seek the face of the Lord, they don't get much. Believers who only read the Bible, but they don't pray according to the promises of God, what the Lord has promised. They don't get much, but believers who will pray, 
you pray alone and you pray together with other believers too it's those believers that are joined together in unity together those are the believers that receive the tenfold blessing the tenfold miracle the tenfold deliverance and the tenfold outpouring of the power and the spirit of the lord i divide the message to three parts number one exploits through unity in prayer exploits through unity in prayer number two experiencing unity among god's people experiencing unity among god's people we need to experience it it's not just to know about unity among the people of god it's not just to appreciate unity among the people of god it's not just to learn about unity among the people of god there must be the practical experience of unity among the people of god and as we all come here if that experience will be ours that all the believers are joined together and according to the king james version are knit together in love joined together knit together and in common language glued together in love it says when those hearts are joined together in unity there's manifestation of great irresistible power that's why i'm inviting you that during this retreat you will experience that unity of spirit of mind of soul of intention of ambition of aspiration experiencing unity among god's people number three examples of united people in prayer examples of united people in prayer number one exploits through unity in prayer we're looking at james chapter five james chapter five i'm reading from verse 16. confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that ye may be healed confess your faults one to another isn't there a measure of agreement there isn't there a measure of unity there that you know that you have some faults especially if you have offended somebody you know it and she knows it you know it and he knows it and you want this temple power in prayer and then it comes to your mind you you offended your brother you offended your sister you offended a prayer partner and you're going to join together in prayer what do you do if you let that offense remain in between you you miss the unity there will be disunity and discord and division and with that disunity and discord and division you cannot pray in unity together and you miss quite a lot but when you come to a retreat like this in your mind you examine yourself and you see what might be a stumbling block a barrier a wall of partition between you and your brother between you and your sister between you and your fellow and your fellow believer and then you confess your faults one to another and then it says when you do that you pray one for another isn't that believers uniting together believers getting together and believers joining their mind their heart their spirit their soul their intention their vision together we want the blessing of the lord and then it says the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much that means that we go for cleansing in the blood of the lamb if you remember anything that is in your life that ought not to be there if you are backsliding back into sin then you say lord i'm going to be sincere 
I'm going to be open. I'm going to be frank. And then you go to the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh Lord, cleanse me once again with the blood that was shed for me on the cross of Calvary. And when you are cleansed like that, then you become righteous. Then you come now to pray, standing on the unchanging word, the promises of the Lord. And it says, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. What if the two righteous men, two righteous believers, three righteous believers, the effectual fervent prayer of righteous believers will avail much, much, much more. Because now we have a tenfold increase. We're told in Mark chapter 11. Mark chapter 11. I'm reading from verse 22. And Jesus answering says unto them, more than one person, unto them. And Jesus our Lord, actually before this time, Jesus had done some spectacular thing. He had looked at a particular tree not bearing fruit. And he gave a word of authority. And that word of authority dried up the tree. And then one of the disciples then noted and said, Master, that tree that you gave a word of command to is dried up already. And then Jesus wanted to teach them the power in prayer. The authority believers have in prayer. The anointing that we can have in prayer. And the answer we can receive from the Lord in prayer as a result of what he had done. That's why he said, Jesus answered and said unto them, Have faith in God. And that's exactly what the Lord is telling you as you come to this retreat. You have any challenge? Have faith in God. You have any problem? Have faith in God. Faith will get you where other things in life cannot get you. Faith will get you where money cannot get you to. Faith will get you where all the people you know on earth may not be able to get you to. Have faith in God. You have any challenge? Any difficulty? Any unsurmountable problem? Anything weighing you down, have faith in God. But remember, He said it unto them. And if you have faith in God, He has faith in God, and she has faith in God, and you join your faith together, and you come to pray unto the Almighty God, that faith joined together will roll away every kind of problem in your life, even from tonight in Jesus' name. In verse 23, for verily I say unto you, certainly I say unto you, assuredly, I say unto you, that if whosoever shall say unto this mountain, and there's still another message coming when we speak to every mountain. And every mountain here, every mountain there, everything will vanish away. I said there's still another message coming and you'll be there. I said you'll be there. And then all of us in unity of faith will rise up with faith and with authority in the name of Jesus and every mountain will be moved away in Jesus name but now is to prepare mind and be united together and be so united that we know that nothing will be able to confront us as the people of God that whosoever shall say unto this mountain be thou removed and be cast into the sea and shall not doubt in his heart but shall believe that those things which he says shall come to pass he shall have whatsoever he says I will have whatsoever I say I will have whatsoever I say this retreat is going to be a great blessing for me this retreat is going to roll away all mountains from my life. 
This retreat is going to, I thought you'll say it for yourself. I said, it will roll the world mountains away from your life in Jesus' name. Therefore, I say unto you, that what things soever ye desire when ye pray, believe that ye receive them, and ye shall have them. That's where many people stop. That they speak to the mountain, and the mountain will move. That's where most people stop. That whatsoever they say, that the Lord will give it to them. But don't stop there. Go to the next two verses. Verse 5, that you forgive if you have ought against any. That your Father also, which is in heaven, may forgive you your trespasses. For if you forgive not, neither will your Father, which is in heaven, forgive your trespasses. He's telling us then that if you're going to have this multiplication, this increase of power, forgiveness is very essential. It's a forgiveness that ties you together. If you don't forgive one another, there cannot be unity. You'll be turning your backs on one another. And the Lord is saying, when you are not heart to heart in fellowship, mind to mind in fellowship, when there is no love, sincere love, in fellowship together, it says it hinders your prayer. That means then, as we talk about unity, it's not just the doctrinal unity, that's great, we have that already. It's not just unity in name. We have that already. You bear the name, this church. We bear the same name of the same church. Not just that. It's not just the unity that we're sitting together. That's great. But the unity that has your heart involved in it. Total forgiveness of all offenses and love. And fellowship that all the odds and all the offenses are gone and there is no reaction that shows there's no forgiveness if if that fellowship is there if that unity and that love is there then it says you can ask what you want and it shall be done unto you acts of the apostles chapter 4 Acts chapter 4, we're reading from verse 24. In Acts chapter 4, reading from verse 24, And when they heard that, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord. That's the unity. When they heard how the members of the Sanhedrin threatened the church, threatened the leadership, of the church and they wanted to stop them from preaching jesus christ our savior jesus all in all when those believers had they came to one accord and they joined their voice together and they said lord thou art god which has made heaven and earth and the sea and all that in them is who by the mouth of thy servant David has said, Why did the heathen rage, and the people imagine vain things? And the kings of the earth stood up, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord, and against his Christ, for the truth, against thy holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, what the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together. The people of the world were united in their enmity against Christ. And if we are going to be able to confront the united world, the united enemies, the united opposers of the gospel, we cannot allow them to be more united than we are. 
we have to be as well united. In verse 28, for to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done. And now, Lord, behold their threatenings and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word by stretching forth thine hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be done by the name of thy holy child Jesus they prayed in unity not only two of them not just twelve not just seventy these people here now more than three thousand more than eight thousand all together and they all came together and in great unity it's a kind of unity they had never seen before even when the lord jesus christ was with them in his earthly ministration they were not as united there were many times they had arguments in between them who is great who is small who is significant who is important who is more useful who is less useful but at this time now with one accord in unity they lifted up their voice there was no disagreement among them there was no discord among them there was no disunity among them. They were looking the same direction. They were thinking about the same thing. And they were focused on the same challenge. And they were confronting the same enemy. All together, unity. Unity of purpose and unity of heart. And they prayed with such a unity that we are told in verse 31. And when they had prayed, the place was shaking where they were assembled together and they were all filled with the holy ghost and they speak the word of god with boldness look at their practical unity in verse 32 practical unity not theoretical unity practical unity not mere doctrinal unity practical unity not tribal unity look at verse 32 and the multitude of them that believed with one heart and of one soul unity that's how they prayed one voice in verse 24 in verse 32 one heart in verse 32 one soul one voice one heart one soul no wonder the lord did great exploits in their midst no wonder there was the outpouring of the power of the holy ghost all over again no wonder they defeated the greatest enemy to the christian faith that ever rose up in ages because it says the multitude of them that believe of one heart and of one soul neither said any of them that aught of the things which he possessed was his own but they had all things common in verse 33 and with great power did the apostle give the apostles witness of the resurrection of the lord jesus and great grace was upon them all i pray that grace will be upon us that this period and this retreat will be a retreat of united believers believers united with one voice at the time of prayer believers united with one heart one soul one conviction one purpose one direction one desire during this retreat and great will be our victory in jesus name point number two experiencing unity among god's people experiencing unity among god's 
people. How do we experience unity? Among us. If we're going to experience unity, there are things the Lord will take away from us. And there are things the Lord will give unto us. Number one, if we're full of self, what I want, what you want, the me, the I, the self, if we're full of self, self will clash with self. What she wants will clash with what she wants. What she desires will clash with what you desire. But when the Lord puts self to death, then we're coming together now and there will be unity. The Lord needs to take off pride from our hearts. Pride. I know more than he knows. She, she knows less than I know. And we look down on other people as if we have the answer, the solution. If that pride is there, there will be conflict. It is pride this canal comparison and then judging other people criticizing one another that's what brings division discord and disunity if we're going to have the unity that pride must go must be removed and then the Lord must give us an experience with him and that experience will totally make the old nature, the old man, put you to death. And when that old nature, old man, and those marks of the old creature, when they are gone, will be able to experience unity. Until then, unity will just be a story that is told, a dream that we have. It's only when self is put to death, pride taken away, the old man crucified with Christ on the cross, only then will there be this unity. In John chapter 17, John 17 verse 9, I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine. The Lord Jesus Christ said, I pray for them. What's he praying for? Let's look at verse 17. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. When the Lord Jesus Christ was with his disciples, he saw quite a lot that concerned him. James and John came to the Lord privately without the other ten disciples knowing about it. They wanted a place of exaltation. A place where they'll be higher than all the other disciples. In their minds, they looked down on the other ten disciples and they felt justified that they should have the highest place. It was pride, place seeking. They almost became religious politicians. And they said, would you grant us that one should sit on this side and the other on that side in the kingdom. And Jesus said, you don't know what you are asking. Can you drink the cup I will drink? Can you face the challenges I will face? Will you be baptized for the suffering I'll be baptized with? They said, yes, we can. They wanted the position so much 
that they said will do anything to have it. When the ten had it, those of the ten, they were filled with indignation because they felt wait what are you asking one to sit here and the other to sit there how about us this unity came conflict fighting almost came jesus had been concerned with that stage of mind that's why now before he left he gathered them together and he began to pray for them and he said sanctify them through thy truth thy word is truth verse 20 neither pray i for these alone but for them also which for them also which shall believe on me through their word that's for you and for me he prayed for their sanctification and he prayed for your sanctification and my sanctification. And this is the experience that can bring unity among the people of God. Because it's that sanctification that will take, that will deal with the Adamic nature. It is that sanctification that will deal with the old man. It is that sanctification that will deal with the in it, inner pride and self in the heart of man. It is that sanctification that will deal with the old man, the old creature, crucify it, get rid of it. That's why he said, I'm not praying for these alone who are here. I am praying for all the others in generations to come that will believe on me through them. In verse 21, that they all may be one. You see what sanctification does? That they all may be one. Once again, not just one in doctrine. Yes, one in doctrine. Not just one in worship. Yes, one in worship. But one heart to heart, one heart, one soul, one direction, one conviction, with one voice. When we're sanctified, it makes us one. That they all may be one as thou Father art in me. And I in thee, that they all, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. And the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one. Can you think about that? As the Father and the Son are one. Does the Father and the Son, I mean, God the Father and Jesus Christ, say, Son, do they ever disagree? Never. Do they ever go different directions? Never. Do they ever oppose one another? Never. Do they ever contradict one another? Never. Do they ever have internal thoughts against one another? The Father against His only begotten Son. Jesus against His Father. Never. And Jesus said, I am praying for them. That they all may be one. As the Father and me are one. Verse 23. I in them and thou in me. That they may be made perfect in one. And that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. That's what Jesus prayed for concerning the disciples. 
that they will be one, united together. The question is, was that an experience they had? Did that come to reality? Oh yes, it came to reality. That encourages us. That if they could be so united, heart to heart, mind to mind, soul to soul, in the same direction, having the same conviction, if they could be so united, that assures us then that their same experience can be ours. And when the Adamic nature is dealt with, when the old man is dealt with, when the pride we were born with, when that is removed, the same unity he grants unto his people. Let's see the experience with the apostles and the believers of the early church. Acts chapter 1 verse 14. Acts chapter 1 verse 14. These all continued with one accord in prayer. That's the unity there. With one accord in prayer. And with the women. And Mary the mother of Jesus. And with his brethren. Chapter 2. Acts chapter 2 verse 1. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come. They were all with one accord in one place one mind one thought one desire one passion one goal one purpose they were all united together they were in one accord in one place no wonder the manifested great authority and power in the early church chapter 4 verse 32 in chapter 4 verse 32 and the multitude of them that believe of one heart and of one soul neither said any of them that aught of the things which he possessed was his own but he had all things come on chapter 5 Verse 12, they were sanctified. The pride, the big eye, small you, opposing one another, feeling proud against one another, all that was gone. And in Acts chapter 5, verse 12, and by the hands of the apostles were many signs and wonders wrought among the people. And they were all with one accord at Solomon's porch. Now Ephesians chapter 4. Now it's for the church of today to have the same experience that those early believers had. And when we have that same experience, and there's unity, one soul, one mind, one heart, one goal, one purpose, one desire, one ambition, one conviction. They will have the same power, multiplied power, as they had in the early church. Ephesians chapter 4. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1. I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you. That ye walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called. With all lowliness and meekness. With long suffering for bearing one another in love. Enduring, tolerating one another in love. That the strong will endure the weak in love that the knowledgeable will endure and tolerate the ignorant in love that the mature ones will endure tolerate the immature ones in love that there might be difference in height 
differences in experience and differences in accomplishment and achievement but then it says with all loneliness and meekness with long suffering that's long endurance bearing with one another for a long long time with long suffering for bearing one another Enduring one another's idiosyncrasies of problems in love. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. When we have that sanctification, that approaching of the Adamic nature, and the big eye is crushed, crucified, and cancelled, and the self-life is dealt with, then it will be easy for us to come together in unity and pray with such a united voice, such a united faith, and such a united trust and confidence in God. And the windows of heaven will open. I said the windows of heaven will open. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. First Corinthians chapter 1. In First Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the, mercy, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing. I beseech you, brethren, you said, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing. And when we all speak the same thing, our unity will be visible. When we all speak the same thing, our unity will be noticeable. And the people of God will know that we are united. That we speak the same thing. There will be many preachers coming to preach on this pulpit during this retreat. And in all the various locations, when we have the retreat, there will be many, many preachers preaching. And our members, our people, the participants of the retreat, they can tell if we're all speaking the same thing. But if one preacher preaches, and the next preacher comes to contradict the first preacher, then the participants of the retreat will know that we are not united. We are not speaking the same thing. If the state overseer speaks, and then the coordinators and the group coordinators, when it comes to their turn to preach, if they contradict, if they oppose, the state overseer or the region overseer, then the participants will know we're not all speaking the same thing. If in any of the locations at the retreat, anybody stands up and then it directly in confrontation opposes and contradicts what we're hearing from the headquarters then the participants will know we're not united they will not trust in your prayer if they see we are not united because unity brings strength it brings authority against the powers of darkness even the devil can notice if we're not of one heart not of one soul and it will not tremble at her prayer. If the devil sees that the preachers are not united, 
there must be unity on the pulpit and unity at the pew and it is sanctification that does this in sanctification we don't oppose one another in sanctification we don't fight one another in sanctification we don't contradict one another in sanctification, we do not trample upon one another. In sanctification, we don't have any secret hatred in our hearts against one another. In sanctification, we have perfect love. And that perfect love unites us together. And when believers and their ministers unite together and they pray, heaven will pay attention and the demons of hell will tremble and so paul the apostle wrote to the corinthian church as he's writing to you and writing to me today now i beseech you brethren by the name of our lord jesus christ that ye all speak the same thing and that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. In Isaiah chapter 52. Isaiah chapter 52. Verse 8. Thy watchmen shall lift up the voice. Do you notice watchmen in the plural, voice in the singular? Thy watchmen, they'll be so united together, they will lift up one voice. Well, the voice together shall they sing. For they shall see eye to eye. That's unity. For they shall see eye to eye. When we're sanctified, there'll be nothing in us wanting to oppose the other fellow. There'll be nothing in us uh, coming to preach and saying, well, before I go on with my message, what uh, brother so-and-so preach, what the other fellow preached the other time. I don't agree. I don't see eye to eye. When we're sanctified, the watchmen will see eye to eye when the lord shall bring again zion that's the kind of unity he wants us to have in first corinthians chapter 12 first corinthians chapter 12 experiencing unity among god's people and it is this kind of unity that makes the almighty god to work in an unprecedented manner in our midst. First Corinthians chapter 12. I'm reading to you from verse 12. First, the body is one and has many members, and all the members of that one body, being many, are one body. So also is Christ. In verse 14, if the foot shall say, because I'm not the hand, I'm not of the body. Is each therefore not of the body? It says, nobody should feel inferior to another one. When there's unity, our roles may be different. Our assignments may be different. But one is not superior to the other. And one is not inferior to the other. We come with that mind of unity before the Lord. And if the ear shall say, because I'm not the eye, I'm not of the body. Is it therefore not of the body? If the whole member, if the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where were the smelling? But now at God search the members, every one of them in the body, as it has pleased him. And if they were all one member, where were the body? But now 
there are many members, yet one body. That's unity. And there I cannot say unto the hand, I have no need of thee. The eye should not feel so superior to the hand. I can see, but the hand can only handle and, and hold. And that kind of comparison between us will be evidence that we don't have sanctification. When there's sanctification, we don't feel superior. Neither do we want anybody to feel inferior. And then it says, but now, in verse 20, there are many members, yet one body. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of thee, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of thee, of you. Even the head. By its place in the highest position of the body, cannot say to the feet by its place in the lowest position of the body i have no need of you nay much more those members of the body which seem to be more feeble and necessary and those members of the body which were seen to be less honorable upon these will bestow more abundant honor and our uncomely parts have more abundant comeliness. For our comely parts have no need, but God has tempered the body together. Having given more abundant honor to that part which large. That there should be no schism, no division, no disunity, no contradiction, no opposition in the body. But that the members should have the same care for another. And whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with each. Or one member be honored, all the members rejoice with each. That's the unity the Lord wants us to experience. And when we get sanctified, that's the kind of unity we enjoy. Number one, exploits through unity in prayer. Number two, experiencing unity among God's people. Number three, examples of united people in prayer. Examples of united people in prayer. In first Peter chapter 3. First Peter chapter 3, verse 7. Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. That's where the united prayer actually begins. Husband and wife. And then parents and children. And then members of the church to all the members of the church. And then the whole leadership in the church uniting together. One voice one mind, one heart, one soul. In verse 8, finally be all of one mind. Be all of one mind. All. Be all of one mind. That's Christianity. Anything less than that will just be religion, not Christianity. It says, as we come together for this tenfold power increase retreat. It says, finally now, be all of one mind, having compassion one of another. Can you see that visible unity? 
noticeable unity, the care without discrimination. Not that you care for those that have your special class, and then you abandon, you overlook the joy and the need of other people, maybe not in your class. Be all of one mind, having compassion one of another. Love as brethren. Be pitiful. Be courteous. Be polite. Be courteous. That means be polite. Unity involves that kind of fellowship, that kind of politeness. Courtesy. Not trying to do any evil for evil. That brings us again to the matter of fellowship and forgiveness. Whatever might have happened to anyone, a sanctified soul will forgive and forbear and forgo. Just forget about it. And then you are not rendering evil for evil. Or really for railing, but contrary wise blessing. Knowing that ye are there unto called, that ye shall inherit a blessing. For he that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips that they speak no guile. Let him eschew evil, shun evil, avoid evil, run away from evil, and do good. Let him seek peace and ensue it, pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open unto their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. In Colossians chapter 2, verse 2. Colossians chapter 2, verse 2. That their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love, joined together in love, cleaving together in love, glued together in love. That their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love and unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ. And then in Exodus chapter 17, Exodus chapter 17, Reading from verse 8. Then came Amalek and fought with Israel in Rephidim. Then came Amalek and fought. The fight always begins with the Amalekites. No, never with Israel. The fight always begins with the world, never with the church. Then came Amalek and fought with Israel in Rephidim. And Moses said unto Joshua, choose us out men and go fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in my hand. So in verse 10, Joshua did... As Moses had said to him, and fought with Amalek, and Moses, Aaron, and Ur went up to the top of the hill. You see unity there, Joshua on the field, where the army of Israel fighting against the Amalekites. And Moses on top of the mountain with Aaron and all together united will defeat any enemy if we're united. And if it's in our hearts that the Amalekites should not have the upper hand 
against the Israel of God, then we are to come together and be united against the enemy of Israel. And then we go to the mountain top and we focus and concentrate on this one thing that Amalek will be defeated. And during this retreat, Amalekites will be defeated in Jesus' name. And it came to pass when Moses held up his hand that Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. You see, everything does not just depend on the strength of Joshua. Everything does not depend on the strategy of the army of, of Joshua. Everything does not depend on the skill, the ability of Joshua and his army. Unity between Moses and Joshua. Unity between Joshua and the army that followed him. Unity between Moses, Aaron, and all. That's why I said, and I want to say it again. If Moses and Aaron and all, if the leadership, if they do not come to form a kind of strong unity, Whatever Joshua does on the field, Israel will be defeated. If Israel is defeated, the shame will also come on Moses and all and Aaron. And that's the reason why in our church, the leadership must be united. The state of Assyrians, or the region of Assyrians, well, the whole leadership at the headquarters. And the leadership at the headquarters, the coordinators and the workers and the group coordinators were the pastor. If we're not united, Joshua will be defeated. All the workers of their Joshua sectional leader there, their work will not succeed if there's no unity. It's unity that will multiply our strength. It is unity that will multiply our power. It is unity that will destroy all the works of the devil against the Israel of God. Verse 12. But Moses' hands were heavy. And he took a stone and put it under him. And he sat thereon. And Aaron and all stayed up his hands, the one on the one side, and the other on the other side. And his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. And Joshua discomfited Amalek and his people of the edge of the sun, we will defeat all the Amalekites. I said we're going to defeat all the Amalekites as we unite together in prayer. Great, mighty things will be taking place in all the retreat locations and over here in Jesus' name. In Acts of the Apostles, chapter 12. Acts, chapter 12, verse 5. Peter, therefore, was catched in prison but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto god for him Do you see unity there peter was in the prison nobody accused peter oh well he didn't have enough faith if he had enough faith why should they keep him in the prison maybe he had committed some secret sin nobody thought anything negative that's unity once again, I want to remind you, the church at this time was sanctified. Sanctified men, sanctified women, 
do not kind of spread around false accusation against the leadership and so the whole church came together and they prayed unto god without ceasing verse 6 and when herod would have brought him forth the same night peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains and the keepers before the door kept the prison and behold the angel of the lord came upon him in answer to the prayer of the church united prayer pray with one voice one mind one heart one soul one desire one conviction they wanted the deliverance of peter and it says they were all praying but peter was sleeping in the prison and behold the angel of the lord came upon him and the light shined in the prison and he smote peter on the side and raised him up saying arise up quickly and his chains fell off from his hands and the angel said unto him gird thyself and bind on thy sandals and so he did and he said unto him cast thy garment about thee and follow me and he went out and followed him and he wist not that it was true which was done by the angel but he thought he saw a vision when they were past the first and the second watch they came unto the iron gate that leadeth unto the city which opened to them of his own accord and they went out and passed on through one street and forthwith the angel departed from him and when peter was come to himself he said now i know of a surety that the lord has sent his angel and has delivered me out of the hand of Herod and from all the expectation of the people of the Jews. And when he had considered the scene, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose son name was Mark, where many were gathered together praying. He got to the place where they were praying. And you see what their prayer did because the prayer was a prayer of unity they prayed with one heart one soul one mind one faith one desire one conviction one request and because of that unity in prayer god answered their prayer and deliverance came god is going to answer our prayer Matthew chapter 18, verse 19. Matthew chapter 18, verse 19. Again, I say unto you, that if two of you shall agree as touching anything that they shall ask, if two of you shall agree, agreement, togetherness, unity our hearts bound together our love bound together our souls bound together our intentions and desires bound together from morning till evening till night all through the time we take all this unity and discord and division and disagreement away from our midst and then we approach the throne of grace with united heart and with united soul and united mind that if you official agree has touched anything that you ask whatsoever it is it says it shall be done for them of my father which is in heaven the lord will answer our prayer this retreat time will be a time of great manifestation of power and many many problems will be rolled away in jesus name impossibilities will become possible 
mountains will get away the challenges we have been facing for a long time as we come in unity together everything will vanish away in jesus name the strongest of the enemies of the people of god we're going to do we're going to destroy the powers of those enemies in jesus name unity multiplies our strength unity multiplies our power unity multiplies our effectiveness as we come to the lord now in prayer you check up your heart is there any pride there is there any self there is there any unsanctified attitude there is there any contradiction there is there any opposition there is there anything there that is waging war against another member of the church or against anybody on earth you tell the lord oh lord cleanse my heart purge my heart take away from my heart anything that will not allow unity to prevail and then when your heart is coming to unity unity with the word of god unity with the spirit of god unity with the leadership in the church unity with the doctrine unity with all the members of the church with one heart one mind one soul we come to the lord great will be the victory we're going to have in jesus name we rise up now, we rise up now, and you're going to pray that God will bring your heart to unity with the people of God. Unity in spirit, unity in your soul, unity in your mind, unity in your conviction, unity among the people of God. It is that visible, noticeable unity that brings us the multiplied power in prayer open your mouth and pray